Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, I want to thank uh, Senator Boxer for her tremendous effort in working with me uh, from the beginning on this bill. I want to thank Senator Collins for her dedication and leadership in making this a bipartisan bill uh, to bring so many of us together on such an important piece of work. I want to thank all my colleagues standing here today uh, who are original co-sponsors who have helped to shape this bill, make it stronger, make it a better bill. I also want to thank Senator Johans, who could not be here today due to a scheduling conflict, uh, for also joining our effort to make this bipartisan. I want to thank our House colleagues who are here who are going to help us lead the fight on, uh, in both chambers. Uh, Representative Dan Benachek, whose daughter is serving in our military, and we are grateful for her service every single day. And I want to thank Tulsi Gabbard, who has also served in our military, and I'm extremely grateful uh, for your service and your leadership on this issue. And I especially want to thank all the brave men and women who have served this country in the past. Uh, they are asked to give everything for this country. And I am extremely gra grateful for all that they do, not only their courage and their sacrifice, but their willingness to even give their lives. The issue of sexual violence is not new. It has been allowed to go on in the shadows for far too long. And for all of us, we believe enough is enough. It's time to change this system that has been held over since George Washington, that is simply not working today for the men and women who are serving. Due to the series of incredibly hard to fathom events, this issue has been raised in the national consciousness. We have to seize this opportunity and act now so we can move towards a true zero tolerance reality in the armed services. Words are not enough at this point. We need action. Today, we are taking a strong bipartisan step forward. America is home to the best and the brightest, brave men and women who joined our armed services for all the right reasons, to serve our country, defend all that we hold sacred, to make America's military the best in the world. We ask everything of these men and women, and each time we ask something of them, they answer the call of duty. But too often, these men and women find themselves in the fight of their lives, not in some far away land or on a battlefield, but right here on our own soil, within their own ranks and commanding officers as victims of horrific acts of sexual violence. Last year reported 26,000 cases of unwanted sexual contact, sexual abuse, and rape. 26,000 cases in just one year. But of those, only just over 3,000 were actually reported. Congress would be derelict in its duty of oversight if we just shrugged our shoulders and did nothing, did nothing for these 26,000 sons and daughters, husbands and wives, mothers and fathers. We have to do better by them. When a person in charge of preventing sexual assault in their ranks is himself arrested on charges of alleged sexual assault, clearly we have a strategy in place that is not working. Twice in just one week this has happened. And when any single victim of sexual assault is forced to salute her attacker, clearly our system is broken. So today we're standing in a united front to take on these issues with new legislation that will fundamentally remove the decision making from the chain of command and gives that discretion to an experienced military prosecutor where it belongs. Just like many of our allies have already done around the world, Britain, Canada, Israel, Germany, Norway, and Australia, just to name a few. And this is the only way that we can provide the unbiased justice that our victims need. Under our bill, serious crimes punishable by more than a year of confinement would be investigated and prosecuted by the JAG Corps, experts specifically trained on this issue who know how to carry out the investigation and take cases to trial. We make a sensible exemption for crimes that are uniquely of the military in nature, such as disobeying orders or going absent without leave. When we take these cases outside of the chain of command, we give the victims the basic confidence to know that justice will be had and that there will be accountability and transparency in their case. That's how we will be able to achieve the reforms that we think is needed that will ensure justice and fairness for every victim. I now like to allow Susan Collins to, to speak on the bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Gillibrand, and let me thank you for your leadership and 
taking on such an important issue. The issue before us today is tragic. It is tragic not because of the nature of wars or because of the traditions under which the military operates. It is tragic because sexual violence is illegal and completely unacceptable and yet appears to be continuing unabated. Kristen has already given you the sobering statistics. Let me add just a couple more in support of our bill. 33% of the women who reported sexual assaults said that they were dissatisfied with how their commanders handled their reports. 27% of women reported that they were sexually harassed by someone in their own military chain of command. Now, no war comes without costs, but these costs should be borne out of conflict with the enemy, not because of egregious violations with some by some of our own troops, obviously most of whom serve very honorably. What does it say about us as a people, as a nation, as the foremost military in the world when some of our service members, both men and women, have more to fear from their fellow soldiers than from the enemy? Why is there less outrage when service women in particular suffer at the hands of their fellow servicemen than from the enemy? This epidemic of sexual abuse cannot stand. We must take these allegations seriously, and most of all, we must ensure that justice is swift and certain for the criminals who have perpetrated these crimes. I would say to my colleagues and everyone here that most of these words are words that I spoke at a hearing before the Armed Services Committee nine years ago, on February 25th, 2004. And the response from General Casey, who was then Deputy Chief of Staff for the Army and ultimately was promoted to Chief of Staff of the Army speaks volumes about the problem. He said to me, Senator, you mentioned in your opening statement the fact that our female soldiers may have more to fear from their fellow soldiers than they do from the enemy. And I think I'd be remiss if I didn't assure you and the committee that I absolutely and fundamentally don't believe that to be a true statement. Well, no wonder we have made so little progress with that kind of denial of the problem. To be fair, I want to emphasize that I believe that our current military leaders are sincerely committed to solving this problem. But it is crystal clear to me that legislation is needed and that our bill is an important step in the right direction. Thank you. Senator Boxer. Uh, I just want to say thank you to Senator Gillibrand, Senator Collins, my colleagues who are here. We started working on this bill in March. The staffs have been working day and night to figure it out and get it right. I want to note that there are some tears in the front row over here. I hope to God they're tears of hope. Yes, they are. Because we have heard you. And we know this is happening. And every one of us, I know everyone up here, we're not going to stop 
do we fix this? And Senator Collins is so right. She got the brush off, you got the brush off, we got the brush off, we're still getting a little bit of a brush off, but anyone who knows us knows that's not gonna happen. Instead of going th reiterating what has been said, because it speaks for me, I just wanna focus for a minute on two charts, which really shows us the problem. So if you could help me here, Kirsten, thank you. Okay, so we have two problems. We have, um, let's hold this up, a 1% problem. I want everyone to see it. We have a 1% problem, and that's a problem that started us all down this road when we found out that a commander who knew nothing about the law overturned a military jury. And we looked into the problem, and we found out it is a problem, but it's out of the 238 convictions, which is the saddest number I've ever seen, given that there's 26,000 incidents here, less than 1% have been overturned. However, that's terrible, and we ended in our bill. That's the least controversial part of our bill, and that's one that will be fixed. But the bigger issue is the one that I'm gonna show you now. And could somebody just, <laughs> I'm not good at that. Um, Susan Collins, you are such a star, and Jeannie, look at this. This is sisters. This is sisters helping sisters. This is the 90% problem. There are 26,000 estimated sexual assaults in 2012. Out of that, 3,374 reports. That is 90% of the people who are abused are not reporting it. So anyone who tells you that it should stay in the chain of command should understand it's in the chain of command and it is a utter failure. People are not reporting, 90% of the people, and these people will tell you why. What happens to you when you report? And by the way, your commander, just after he knows about it, could say, forget it. So that's the end of that system. Thank you so much. So here's what we do. Yeah, so here's what we do in conclusion. In our bill, we say the professionals who are the prosecutors and the experts in the legalities of what happened to you will make the decision. And no one can overturn that. If they believe you have a case, they will move forward. You will get your trial. And by the way, if the perpetrator is guilty, Nobody can overturn the verdict. If he wants to have an appeal, of course. This is a sensible bill. This is a critical bill to stop an epidemic. We're gonna stop it, and we're not gonna be stopped. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is Congressman Dan Benichek. Uh, thank you. I'd like to uh, thank Senator Gillibrand and the others up here who have uh, relayed what's going on in our Defense Department. The Defense Department estimated 26,000 episodes of sexual assault in our military in 2012. 3,400 reported. 87% of the cases are unreported. You know, I, I've been a doctor all my life, and uh, as a physician, I realize how intensely difficult it is for a victim of sexual assault to simply report the case. It's so intensely personal and difficult that the, the victim needs an independent professional prosecutor to discuss it with, not have to be responsible to their boss. You know, my daughter served in the military, and as a father, I know how wonderful the women that serve in our military are. They're hardworking, dedicated individuals, and they deserve better than this. The status quo is not good enough. Uh, we need to solve this problem now, and in a bipartisan effort, we're gonna come to a solution to this problem. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard. Thank you, I'm so proud and honored to be here joining with such a strong group of legislators who are strong with resolve in taking action on what has been a long overdue issue that needs to be resolved. 
Really the cornerstone of the action that we're taking today with this legislation provides a more uniform and fair process to ensure that victims are heard and that sexual predators are exposed and punished accordingly. Ensuring a victim-centered response is essential to making sure that this safe and transparent process creates a climate that allows a victim to come forward and that they are guaranteed this transparent process free of influence from the chain of command. Serving in the military, every service member in every branch of service is instilled from day one with the great values that make our military strong. The values of integrity and honor, respect, duty. This is what makes us proud to wear the uniform. And the fact that this has been allowed to go on undermines the essence of what these values really mean. So it's our responsibility here in Congress, it's our responsibility to hold the leaders of our Department of Defense accountable to make sure that these actions are taken, why we're introducing this legislation, and we will follow through to make sure that this happens. Thank you. Our next speaker is Senator Dick Blumenthal. Thank you. Uh, let me begin by thanking my colleagues, especially Senator Gillibrand for her leadership. Senator Boxer and Senator Collins have been at the forefront of this effort and really everyone standing here and others who could not be here. This idea has reached a time when failing to implement it would be irresponsible. And I speak here as someone who is a member of the Armed Services Committee, who has served in the military and has two sons currently serving. And I think the most ardent advocates of this kind of measure would be members of the military themselves who regret sincerely from the very top in the Joint Chiefs of Staff to the lowest ranking members that a stain has been cast on military service by the small minority, and it remains a small minority, who have committed these heinous, vicious, predatory crimes. We can talk about the numbers here, but the numbers are less important than the culture. And the culture has existed because of a failure in prosecutions. And I speak also as a former prosecutor, as a former United States attorney for four and a half years and attorney general of my state for 20 years. Prosecutorial decisions are often the most important in the justice system. The decision whether to charge and what to charge are often as important as the conviction. They make or break somebody's life and they have consequences well beyond the numbers of years that someone serves in prison. And they are among the most solemn and serious decisions that anyone in public office can make. These kinds of decisions should be made by someone independent someone trained and experienced with a lifetime of involvement in justice and military justice. And that's the reason that this bill is so important. I've suggested some additional measures, such as establishing a victim's restitution or compensation system so that the perpetrator can be held responsible financially and the victim comp compensated, if not from the perpetrator, then from a general fund, establishing an ombudsman to investigate miscarriages of justice when they occur, and punitive mandatory discharge. Believe it or not, there are some perpetrators convicted through the military justice system who remain in the military and then receive a general or honorable discharge. That cannot be allowed to continue. So this legislation is fundamentally important. It is far-reaching and profoundly significant to the future of military justice, but it is, in fact, just a beginning. It is a beginning, not an end 
because changing the continuum of harm, the continuum of harm that results in almost every woman in the military receiving at some point some unwanted sexual approach or contact. I've spent a lot of time talking to women in the military. A fraction of the cases are reported, but almost every woman in the military expects at some point to, to receive an unwanted approach. So I call on the President to take whatever action he can by executive order. I call on the Secretary of Defense to endorse this bill, but also appoint a general officer right now, immediately, to take action within his authority to begin the ombudsman function and take charge of this problem so that he can demonstrate and send a message that, in fact, there is zero tolerance. The military, I believe, is firmly committed to end unwanted sexual conduct and sexual assault I think now we need action, not just plans and promises. And I believe that the Secretary of Defense has it within his power to do more and will do more. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. Our next speaker is Mark Begich. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Gillibrand, and also to Senator Collins and Senator Box and all of us that are here. I'm honestly pleased to be standing here and united with my colleagues to address the disturbing issues facing our nation, sexual assault in our military. Recent incidents have shown very troubling trends. 30% increase in the number of anonymous sexual assaults reported in the past two years alone. Incidents involving senior leaders on the rise. Abuse of the military judicial system. An outdated system which gives too much discretion to commanders to not pursue charges or overturn convictions, essentially allowing them to let perpetrators free. And we've seen sentences not even close to fitting the crime being issued by court-martialed members. For example, in Alaska, the sentence of Nicholas Howard, a Marine recruiter who raped an Alaskan woman, woman last year, found guilty of rape, he received a mere dishonorable discharge. It's too, totally outrageous when you think of this. Sexual assaults is a serious crime. Even today, we had the Army caucus meet this morning. The Chief of Staff of the Army called it a cancer in the military. A system of culture that allow for sexual assault criminals to thrive is inexcusable. That's why I'm pleased to be part of this effort to overhaul the military broken judicial system. This legislation will institute transparency, accountability, and objectivity to the system that has been far too long. It will promote justice being served rather than avoided. It will provide victims some measure of comfort in the system that they rely on for justice. We can never do enough to prevent and address sexual assault in the military. We need to get serious, truly, about this issue. Not tomorrow, not next year, but right now. Recent incidents demand urgency of our action. We owe our freedom to these members of the military. We owe it to have them safe when they serve in the military. It is truly an honor to be here with these great legislators, both from the House and the Senate, and it should indicate to the folks here in this room how clearly committed we are to end sexual assault within the military. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chris Coons. He's left. Uh, Maisie. Maisie. Senator Maisie Hirono. Thank you very much. I want to thank Senators uh, Gillibrand, Collins, and Boxer, and all of my colleagues who are here to focus on this really important issue. And also, um, welcome to our colleagues from the House, a special aloha to my colleague from Hawaii, uh, um, Tulsi Gabbard. I'm pleased, of course, to join everyone here. It, much has been said about the record number of women in the U.S. Senate and the record number of women who serve on the Armed Services Committee. And of course, without minimizing the commitment and the work of our male colleagues uh, focusing on this very important issue, I want to say that women who serve uh, in the House and Senate bring some unique life experiences to this process. Many women, if not most women at some time or other, have experienced sexual harassment or unwanted sexual advances. 
but because of the command structure in the military, the power component attendant to sexual harassment and worse in the military is obvious and problematic. My colleagues have already talked about the numbers and what we need to do. The time is now to do it. And I also want to acknowledge the presence of the survivors of sexual trauma in the military and note that a huge percentage of the sexual trauma is experienced by men, not just women, in the military. More than half. More than half. So uh, clearly this is, uh, this is an issue that requires immediate uh, action and I join my colleagues in moving forward and with all of you, mahalo. Uh, Senator Jean Shaheen. Thank you, Senator Gillibrand. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you to Senator Boxer, Senator Collins, and to all of my colleagues here. Um, we are here because we support our men and women in the military. And we believe that the scourge of sexual assault is a stain on the military that needs to change. This legislation is about, is about making those fundamental changes that are going to be needed to address this issue. Um, I just want to reiterate two things that have already been said. One is, as Senator Hirono said, this issue is not just about women in the military. And even though um, the majority of people who are standing here today are women, the fact is that there are actually more men who are victims of sexual assault in our military than there are women. And even though it's a smaller percentage, the numbers are there and we need to understand that this is about men and women serving in the military and they need to have um, recourse if they are victims of sexual assault and we need to change what has become a culture in the military. Um, the second thing is when we pass the National Defense Authorization Act last year, we included a sexual assault panel to take a look at this issue and to make recommendations. I certainly hope that um, Secretary Hagel and our leadership at the Department of Defense will look at what's happening on this issue and expedite the report from that panel just as swiftly as possible because we are going to take action and it would be helpful to have those recommendations as we do this. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kirsten Sinema, uh, Congresswoman. Thank you, Senator Gillibrand. I thank the men and women in our armed forces who are here with us today for their service and for their bravery, for their sacrifice, and for being the voice of many who still remain in the shadows and who wait for the justice that they are seeking. 20 years ago, when I was in college studying to become a social worker, I worked as a rape crisis counselor. I understood then that rape and sexual assault are violent crimes that too often escape the reach of justice. I also knew then that if I could do anything to help stop these violent acts from happening to anyone, even just one person, I would do it. And today, I stand to applaud Senator Gillibrand for her leadership on this issue, and I applaud my colleagues on both sides of the aisle for coming together to do just that. We're here to honor those who risk life and limb for our families and for our country. And we say today that under no condition will we continue to allow unjust harm to come to service members or ranking officers who are victimized by their colleagues. And we will seek through this legislation the fullest protections of the law for the way that these service members have protected our country as well. The fact that sexual assaults in our military remain pervasive and underreported is absolutely unconscionable. The fact that reported incidents have happened twice in the past month by leaders tasked to stop and unroot this in our own military is absolutely unacceptable. It is clear that something is not working. And our job here is to do right by all those who are in this room and around the country for all of these reasons. When the men and women who experience these crimes have to muster incredible determination and courage just to speak to their peers and commanding officers and then don't receive the fullest protection under the law, we have failed them. When they have to do it all over again just to claim the disability benefits that they deserve, we fail them yet again. And that is shameful. This is an issue of conscience. 
but it is also an issue of military readiness and national security. It's about strengthening the strongest armed forces in the world and ensuring that our country is the best, mentally, physically, and emotionally. This simple and common sense reform proposed by Senator Gillibrand to our military justice system places responsibility and accountability into the hands of experienced trial counsel with prosecutorial experience. Our service members deserve nothing less. And before there is any greater detriment to our military readiness and to the brave men and women who serve our country, Congress must pass this reform and seek the President's signature to enforce this law. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much, Kirsten. Um, now I'd like to welcome the advocates and, and survivors up here, please, to come speak and give your testimony. Thank you. You can stay. Come on up, all of you, please, together. Ayana is speaking first. Where is it? Ayana? How do you feel? Our first speaker is Ayana Harrell, U.S. Army veteran, MST survivor, awareness activist, and victim advocate. Hello. My name is Ayana Harrell. I enlisted in the United States Army August of 2000, and within my first six months of service, I was raped at a graduation party off the Redstone Arsenal installation in Huntsville, Alabama. I tried to report my sexual assault twice, but both times I received responses during my advanced individual training that implied to me mission first and suck it up and drive on if I wanted to keep my career. I'm sorry. In hindsight, I feel if I didn't have to report to my chain of command and if military sexual trauma or assault was not so hushed and was being talked about more, I would have said something. In basic training, I remember we had a 10 to 20 minute block concerning rape and the UCMJ punishment for it, but nothing, nothing in reference to who do we go to in the cases of rape. It wasn't until 2004 that the Secretary of the Army established a task force to review Army policy on reporting and addressing sexual assault. As a woman, you ran a risk of being blamed. And also just being a woman, the command climate understanding was, how did you let this happen? And I knew this. So at first I did not report. When I finally reported it, it was not pushed past the room that I reported it in. This is exactly why this bill is so important. Commanders and the chains under them are not trained to be lawyers and judges. Their specific lane is soldiering. Commanders do not have the time nor care to handle sexual assault cases. Also, how can we be sure that a case can be tried impartially for the victim and perpetrator when we have cases popping up every day with the perpetrator being the one in command or in positions of high authority. There needs to be a specific set of guidelines and criminal justice with lawyers and judges outside of the command for military sexual assault and other violent crimes. We the survivors, male and female, demand military criminal justice reform now. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brian Lewis, former Petty Officer, third class, United States Navy. Good morning. My name is Brian Lewis, and I testified earlier this year in front of the Senate Armed Service Committee about how my chain of command failed me. Before I begin, I would like to thank Senator Gillibrand for including male survivors in her efforts to bring attention to the epidemic of military sexual assault. Too often, male survivors are ignored and marginalized in discussions in our country about rape and sexual assault. As Senator Hirono and Senator Shaheen stated, the latest data from the Department of Defense shows that male survivors account for about 14,000 of the 26,000 cases of sexual assault in our military. Put simply, men and male survivors are a majority of rapes in our military. 
to the senators and congressmen here, you have shown true courage and a commitment to all survivors in the, putting forth this legislation. I am a rape survivor. A superior non-commissioned officer raped me while I was stationed aboard the USS Frank Cable in Guam. After the rape, I was told by my command not to file a formal report with the Naval Criminal Investigative Service. When I was reassigned to seek medical help, my psychiatrist told me that I was lying about my rape and diagnosed me with a personality disorder. I was discharged with a general discharge in August 2001. I have been fighting to correct my record ever since. In spite of that, I am proud to say that with the help of federal financial aid because I can't get my GI Bill, I graduated from Stevenson University last Friday with a Bachelor of Science degree. The military did not help me get that degree. I had to get it by myself because I am a rape survivor. I am proud to be standing here in support of this new legislation designed to mandate fundamental change within our broken military system by requiring commanders to immediately forward reports of assault to investigators and by removing the authority to decide whether to prosecute and convene trials from the chain of command. The current system is broken. As in my case, commanding officers often fail to report rape and sexual assaults because of personal biases and conflicts of interest. Survivors, in turn, we are afraid to report out of fear of being re retaliated against, labeled with errant medical diagnosis, errant medical diagnoses often weaponized, such as personality or bipolar disorder, and involuntarily discharged. The military has proven time and again that it is not capable of punishing the perpetrators of rape and sexual assault or stopping the sexual adult epidemic gripping our military. It is time to implement fundamental change and start doing right by our men and women, brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers in uniform. This legislation is a major step in that direction. This bill, through the creation of an advisory council, also grants us, the survivors, a voice in helping to reform the military. We are not unpatriotic for bringing this to light. The military betrayed us by involuntarily discharging us and retaliating against us after we were discharged. Under this bill, we would be able to show our patriotism, our dedication to the military by helping to reform that broken system. Too many survivors have lost their lives to the epidemic of rape in the military. Carrie Goodwin, Sophie Shampoo, Lavina Johnson, they're just but a few that have lost their lives in this epidemic. Their chain of command failed them miserably. We owe it to the families of those lost and those who have yet to serve to pass this bill as expeditiously as possible. It is time to stop letting the military dictate where they want to go and time to start forcing it to go where we need it to go. I am proud to have served my country and continue to serve by helping to end this epidemic in our military. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Brian. Our next speaker is Jennifer Norris, uh, T-Sergeant, United States Air Force. Thank you, Senator. I'd just like to preface by saying these are tears of hope. I've never had this much hope in my life, so thank you. My name is Jennifer Norris. I was raised to love, honor, and serve my country. It was my life's ambition to have a career in the Air Force. I wanted to be chief. I am a veteran and a survivor of rape and harassment in the military. Earlier this year, I testified in front of the House Armed Services Committee on the largest sexual abuse scandal in Air Force history. If the chain of command had been removed from handling sexual assaults before I was attacked, I believe justice would have been served or perhaps it would have been prevented in the first place. At first, I was too afraid to report my assault to my chain of command, but two years later, I was forced to report 
due to the escalation of the behavior and the fear that I would be raped again. Instead, I was re-victimized by the system. I want to make it clear to General Welsh that blaming a civilian hookup culture for the epidemic does nothing but contribute to victim blaming, excusing perpetrators, and it belittles the serious nature of these crimes. This is a problem that requires leadership, not blaming the troops. And it requires appropriate punishment for those who commit the crime and accountability for those who sweep it under the rug or excuse it, as in the highly publicized cases of Lieutenant General Franklin and Lieutenant General Helms as of late. In the Air Force, I witnessed firsthand what happens to those who step forward to report their assaults. I did not want to be stigmatized for reporting my assaults as I tried to move forward in my career. Instead, the best option for me was to try and endure it, to suck it up, and try and make it till I could get transferred somewhere else, only to have it happen over and over again, like a recurring nightmare. Sorry. When I did come forward to my command, I became one of far too many who fall victim to manipulation and abuse of authority by perpetrators who are higher ranking and have more credibility than those who are in charge, with those who are in charge. Troops have no choice but to acquiesce when under the leadership of a heavy fisted chain of command. My perpetrators were allowed to resign in lieu of administrative hearings, which would have become a matter of public record. My command never offered the chance to proceed with a court martial. While I was glad my perpetrators were gone, the reason I finally pressed charges was to prevent any other woman from having to go through what I was forced to endure. My efforts were futile. Since leaving the military, I have dedicated my energy to making sure no man or woman who signs up to serve their country ever has to go through what I experienced. The system is rigged against the victims. Commanders who are responsible for the resolution of these cases are far too often biased in favor of the often higher ranking perpetrators. 50% of victims report their attacker was someone of higher rank and 23% of victims report the perpetrator was in their chain of command. This was true in my case and in many, many others. Until we fix the system and make it safe for victims to report, remove command bias and conflict of interest from the process, take reporting, prosecution, and adjudication out of the chain of command, the military will continue to be plagued by rape and sexual assault, and service members who become victim will be denied justice. Thank you so much, Senators. I have never had so much hope in my life until today. And thank you for helping our men and women in uniform. It, this legislation, if passed, will be a huge, huge step forward. Our next speaker is Anu Bhagwati, our Executive Director for the Service Women's Action Network, SWAN Network. Good morning. My name is Anu Bhagwati. I'm the Executive Director of Service Women's Action Network and a former Marine Corps Captain and Company Commander. 
Swan's mission is to transform military culture by securing equal opportunity and the freedom to serve without discrimination, harassment, or assault. This is a great day for military justice. I want to thank Senator Gillibrand for her tremendous commitment and leadership in working to end military sexual violence once and for all. I'd also like to thank the Senate and House members who stepped up to lend their support to this historic bill. Gratitude also goes to three individuals whose work on this legislation has been pivotal. Swan's policy director, Greg Jacob, Professor Eugene Fidel from Yale Law School, and Professor Beth Hillman from the National Institute of Military Justice. Thousands of service members and veterans, including those you see here today, who were assaulted while serving, have courageously stepped forward and shared their stories with all of us. Their voices have brought us here today. Not much has changed since I left the Marine Corps nine years ago. Sexual harassment is endemic. Sexual assaults are still swept under the rug. Victims are blamed for their attacks and face intimidation and retaliation from their units and commanders. Trainings on sexual assault prevention are conducted by service members who are simply unqualified to teach anything about rape culture, healthy masculinity, or respect for women. Military leaders blame hookup culture and the follies of youth for violent criminal behavior. And they doggedly insist that they are still qualified to retain control of everything in their own units, including the authority to handle serious criminal cases like rape and sexual assault. Deference to the military has a habit in our society. Commanding officers are not legal experts. They are not attorneys. They are not experts on sexual violence. Most know very little about rape culture or the MO and tactics used by sexual predators. And no commanding officer can ever be truly impartial when it is his or her own service member who is being accused of a crime. We need to professionalize the military justice system and ensure that the officials who are handling these crimes <clears throat> are impartial attorneys and judges and not commanding officers. Military leadership's misplaced desire to hold on to the current military judicial system is based on ignorance alone. Today's system does not provide justice to victims and it cannot provide a fair and impartial trial to the accused. We ought to be more concerned with the welfare of our troops. Instead, we desperately cling to an 18th century model of justice. So let's step into the 21st century, as many of our common law allies have already done. I urge Congress, the Joint Chiefs, and the Commander-in-Chief to work across party lines to put our troops first and to ensure swift passage of the Military Justice Improvement Act. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tom Tarantino, the Chief Policy Officer for Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. Good morning. Uh, I want to thank Senator Gildebrand and I want to thank Anu, Anu and Swan for their amazing leadership on this issue. I also want to thank the brave men and women behind me who are giving voice to the thousands, tens of thousands out there who cannot speak for themselves. You know, I, I spent 10 years in the military and I can tell you military life is different. Our world is more dangerous, our responsibilities are more severe, and our community is tighter, at least it should be. It's supposed to be tighter. The backbone of the military is the trust that the men and the women next to you and that your command should have your back. And I spent 10 years in the military, in that time I've been a platoon leader, been an executive officer, and I've taken command. And the most sacred duty I had as an officer was to take care of the men and women who served under me. It was an unspoken promise that we made to the men and women who sent their sons and daughters to serve in the military. And I'm here to tell you right now, we are failing in that promise. When you permit sexual violence, when you commit sexual violence, when you marginalize victims and then victimize them again, you are failing as a leader. And that is what's happening in our military community. And that's what we're here 
to stop. This legislation is a common sense first step, doing something that we should have done years ago in professionalizing the military justice system and making sure that no victim of sexual assault is afraid to come forward. This should be unthinkable in a community like the military. But because we are failing as leaders, it is not. And in fact, it is all too commonplace. So I'm gonna ask Congress to do something that it's not very good at doing, and that's move quickly. Follow the leadership of Senator Gillibrand and those who are here today. And understand that the more you wait to pass this bill, the more victims are going to be marginalized. This is about saving lives and about saving the, not just the integrity of our military, but also making sure that the men and women who stand up to defend our country know that the country and their leaders have their backs. So thank you very much. Our last speaker is Miranda Peterson, the Policy Director for Protect Our Defenders. Good morning. My name is Miranda Peterson, and I'm here today representing Protect Our Defenders, an organization that's dedicated to eradicating the plague of sexual assault in the US military and ensuring adequate care and support for survivors of military sexual assault. Currently, the United States military has a system of justice which gives commanders unfettered power to decide when and if to administer justice in sexual assault and violent crimes. Commanders must no longer be permitted to interfere with victim reporting and judicial proceedings. As many people have pointed out, the majority of perpetrators of these crimes are higher ranking or in the direct chain of command. In recent high-profile cases, we have seen commanders act unilaterally to overturn jury convictions in sexual assault cases. This is a system that is fraught with personal bias, conflicts of interest, abuse of authority, and too often a low regard for victims reporting sexual assaults. As Americans, we know what a justice system is supposed to look like, and we can recognize when a decision is made that is fundamentally unfair. When one commander with no legal training and often a personal connection to the perpetrator is allowed to ignore the findings of a jury and declare a convicted perpetrator as innocent, lessen a sentence, or shut down a case before it ever gets to trial, we know that there is something wrong with the system. Unfortunately, victims of sexual assault are forced to navigate this type of system often alone, without legal representation, and often face retaliation by their command and their unit when they do seek justice to, and try to hold their assailants accountable. Most victims don't have faith in the military justice system. Most of them, rightly, are too afraid to report these crimes. They know it will probably fail in a, the result to punish their perpetrator and that they will likely face personal and professional retaliation. When this act becomes law, commanders like Lieutenant, Lieutenant General Craig Franklin and General Susan Helms, who both ignored the findings of their hand-picked juries and ignored the advice of their legal counsel, will no longer be able to simply erase a sexual assault conviction with the swipe of their pen. The reforms put, put forth in this bill are absolutely crucial to protecting victims from bias and intimidation, and it will give them a fighting chance to achieve justice and to prevent future attacks. The authority to decide which cases go to trial and to determine the ultimate outcome of court martials must be taken out of the chain of command. Protect Our Defenders applaud Senator Gillibrand, Senator Boxer, Senator Collins, and all of the elected leaders who are here today for their leadership on this issue, and we want to thank you. We've asked for those numbers and the military is collecting them for us. There may be a need for additional JAG lawyers. The military can decide that for themselves. Uh, we give them the full authority to actually create the protocols in place for JAG counsel to be able to do these cases. Um, we are elevating all cases that have more than a year of punishment, basically what's comparable to a felony in the civilian system, um, to 
trained prosecutors to make the decision. It's called the disposition authority. We give that disposition authority to JAG counsel. Uh, the convening authority we give to the chiefs to actually um, choose the jurors and choose the judge for each case. And um, we exclude uh, crimes that are specific to the military, such as going AWOL, not uh, absent without leave, uh, or not charging up a hill when you're ordered to do so. Those types of uh, crimes we uh, exclude specifically by article. Sure. Um, our concern is that for sexual assault and rape that there's a lack of reporting. Um, but we've been advised that the reason why the UCMJ works well is because it is uniform and that you want to have clarity and you want to have bright line clarity. So I'll give you just one example. If there's an assault of a male by a female uh, but no sexual act in that assault, is it an assault or a sexual assault? To have to determine that issue and that would determine which way you would go in a judicial system doesn't make sense. So most people who are experts in the criminal code of justice, the military criminal code, have said uniformity is very important for cohesiveness and effectiveness. Uh, the other nations that have made this decision and thought through it did it similarly. They elevated classes of crimes into a separate judicial system. Um, also. Secretary Hagel did make a determination on what he wanted to do with Article 60. And Article 60 is the right to be able to overturn a jury's verdict. He didn't eliminate Article 60 authority for commanders for just sexual assault and rape. He did it for all felonies. So he created the same bright line in his recommendation that we are replicating for Article 30 and Article 22, which are the convening authorities and the disposition authorities. Well, for all of us who support this bill, our job now is to begin to talk to more colleagues, talk to them about the bill, what it does, uh, what our goals are. And as Senator Blumenthal mentioned, there are other bills that are very complementary, that are bills that continue to help solve this problem. There's going to be no quick fix of this epidemic and this really cultural challenge and structural problems. So we are all, as a number of advocates are going to work on all of these measures to move them forward. As the chair of the personnel subcommittee, we are hoping to include many of these measures in our base markup bill that we are actually going to start working on the next week. Um, so we're going to try to take each of the reforms. Uh, Senator Blumenthal mentions one. Others are... Um, uh, Senator Klobuchar has one about record keeping that's very important. Senator Murray and Senator Ayotte have one that's very important about uh, victims' councils. Uh, we have another bill, uh, Lisa Murkowski's on about, uh, oh, uh, Susan Collins is on about mandatory, mandatory um, kicking out of the military if you are convicted. All of those reforms are very smart and good. Um, Senator McCaskill's taken leadership on the Article 60 issue as well. So those are the kind of reforms I think we can move together in our bill and then continue to earn support for this uh, more dramatic shift in the UCMJ, um, which I think is necessary to increase reporting. You, you, you. base markup of the per we're hoping to include it in the um, in the NDAA we are hoping that we can build enough support within the committee that we will have the uh, sufficient support to include it in the NDAA if we don't we will bring it to the floor No, the purpose of that meeting was the White House asked us to come to brief them on what we were working on. What were the solutions that we were putting forward? What did we think the biggest challenges were? And so it was an excellent opportunity for the Congress members and senators to talk very frankly and openly about this problem, about some of the legislative solutions and things the administration could do on their own, uh, almost a, as a working group on how we move this issue forward and solve the problem. Uh, 
I've been seeking Chairman Levin's advice throughout this process. I've talked to him uh, several times about it, really getting his guidance. I mean, the, the, what we are proposing is a significant structural change. And it is something that I think is necessary and important to solving the problem that such so few victims actually feel they can report without being retaliated against. Um, and he's actually given me very helpful feedback throughout this process. So I will continue to brief Senator Levin as we move forward. Um, and I will continue to brief him on the other bills that we're also pushing forward as well. Um, but I'm hoping that, um, and, and you know, he appreciates the progress that we are making on these issues. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, again, I have to earn the support of other senators, and I have to be able to take the time, um, as my colleagues will, with me to brief them, to go through our thinking about why we drafted it the way we did, um, similarities to other um, uh, criminal codes, and what we think this will solve. And we also want to be able to offer this in combination with the five or six other reforms that we think will also help uh, support victims, create compensation, create better transparency and accountability. Excuse me? Well, interestingly, there's been several reactions because we've had several hearings. Um, the first hearing that I held uh, in the personnel subcommittee, we had each of the service um, heads who deal with this issue testify about the problem, what are the solutions. And interestingly, we talked about this idea uh, as part of that hearing, and their answer uniformly was they believed any change in reporting or decision making in the chain of command, whether it was Article 30, Article 22, or Article 60, undermined good order and discipline. Uh, several weeks later, uh, Secretary Hagel decided that he believed Article 60 authority needed to be removed from the chain of command. And the next hearing that I attended had the Air Force Chief of Staff and the Air Force Secretary there, and they then testified in that hearing that removing the Article 60 authority was something that could be done and uh, didn't undermine anything because it was a vestige of pre-World War I um, legal course because there weren't any uh, avenues of appeal. I think through consideration and thoughtful review, they will find that moving this one decision point, which is the disposition authority to decide whether or not to go to trial, um, is an authority that is not necessary for good order and discipline, and in fact, will create the possibility of better order and discipline by allowing victims to feel more comfortable reporting to trained JAG prosecutors. Thank you. Thank you.